Good morning, Idaho. Hope you're having a wonderful morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on when you're listening to this. Welcome to the local Yokel Idaho podcast, where we talk about what is going on in the wonderful state of Idaho. Welcome to the morning banter. This is just kind of me talking a little bit and hanging out with you guys before we get into the bulk of the podcast. Not a lot to talk about this week in general for myself and things that kind of stood out, but I know one of them was that like here in the Treasure Valley, it has been particularly warm for January. I mean, maybe it's just in my thought and my brain, but I remember January always being like worse than December weather-wise, that like it was more cold and like inversions and a bunch of stuff. But so far that hasn't happened. I mean, we're like in the 40s and it's not freezing a ton, which I'm kind of frustrated with because I have a bunch of dogs and I want to let them outside. And it's actually kind of nice when it freezes because then not everything is muddy. And so when they go out, they can go to the bathroom and do their stuff and run around and then come in and I don't have to wipe their feet off. Well, when it's not frozen, they come back and they're all muddy and then I have to clean it. And it's just like, ah, ha, ha more work and all that and everything so it'd be nice to have the freezing temperatures back but on the other hand it is kind of nice to be able to go outside and go for walks and different stuff and be like oh this is kind of this 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 works this is nice but i do know for the rest of the state i've seen weather reports even like some cancellations of some school districts where there has been a lot of snow which is good to hear i mean on the one hand not nice for driving and trying to move around and everything and probably messes with some power at different places and reliability of infrastructure and things but it's great to hear that we're getting a ton of snow and we're building up that reserve and that snowpack so that when it melts in the spring, we'll have plenty of water for the reservoirs and everything because most of our power, I think like 80% of our power comes from hydro. And then for all the agriculture and everything that has to be routed and all that, that you have that is just going to be great. It'd be awesome to have a year where we got enough snow because I feel like every year we just don't quite get enough. And especially for me as someone who likes to go fishing in the reservoirs every year, I'm just like, yep, it's low again, and it's low again, and it's low again. So hopefully with uh, the added amount of snow we're getting, there'll be more of it and the reservoirs can be full, which would make it a little bit more tricky to go fishing, but still it'd be nice for them to be full for the wildlife and everything. Also on kind of a weird note, I swear, I think the last couple weeks, the first part of this year has been kind of weirdly depressing because there's been like a ton of shootings. I mean, don't get me wrong, there are definitely some this week that have occurred and stuff. But it just seems less. I, I Maybe it's just me. You, you can uh, reach out to me and let me know. But I feel like over the last couple uh, weeks, it's just been a lot. And this week, when I was looking at the news and stuff, there wasn't too much. It was actually reasonably positive about the amount of things in the news. And there isn't a ton of shootings and stuff going on, which is really, really encouraging to hear. Maybe it's just the news media is just being like, hey, you know, let's focus on the politics with the Idaho legislative start of it, starting and everything. And so let's not focus on shootings and things. And we're doing nothing and we're been biased and blah, blah, blah. So I don't know. Maybe it's that. I, But it is just nice to see that there's less of that, especially when I try to make the, the news segment for this podcast. I try to keep it a nice balance, if I can, between... Uh, more of the realistic kind of negative stuff because there's always bad things happening, sadly. We live in a fallen world. Um, and what are positive and interesting and cool things going along in the state. So it's a nice, well-balanced um, kind of type of feed of things going on. But with that said, there is one thing um, I did want to share related to the podcast. I'm going to be changing a little bit with the holiday and interesting events section of the podcast. Not a ton, but I'm going to try to cut it down a little bit more in the sense of like birthdays and deaths. I'm just going to be a lot more strict on what people I put on that or not. So it'll hopefully cut down the time because I'm trying to figure out how to save some more time on the podcast so I can fit some other things on here and different things. And so one of the things I can do is try to streamline and try to summarize more of the holiday events and stuff for the week and interesting events. I love them. I really do. I wish I could like go all into it. But at the end of the day, the podcast is not about history, which is one of my passions and loves. It's about Idaho, which is another one of my joys and passions. Um, and so I need to prioritize that and probably shrink that. For some of you out there, you're probably like, oh, come on, Tyler. I wanted it to be smaller anyways. I want you to get to the news and the events. But the whole reason it's there is for it to be something that isn't so about news and sports and events and politics, something a little bit more lighthearted, something a little bit more enjoyable, and hopefully something that like educates your day and makes you guys laugh or maybe the family sees some uh, national day or event that's occurring that you know you guys can go do and it's fun and it's joyful and it, it kind of brings up breaks up the seriousness 
that sometimes can occur when you have a podcast that's about, you know, events and politics and news and things that it kind of, it makes it a little bit more enjoyable. That's my hope, but we are going to be cutting that down a little bit. Um, You'll kind of see that today that like the birthdays and death section is going to be a lot shorter. I'm trying to just focus on like people that you might know, the big hitters, and then anyone else that, you know, maybe they did something really cool in history, um, but no one probably knows their name, kind of cutting them out, which is sad, but just for the sake of time and making it more efficient. It won't affect the history section. If there's a truly interesting history thing, I'm just going to keep that, keep rolling with that. National days, going to keep the same because I can't cut that, but birthdays and deaths are going to shrink. But with that said, we'll get into the rest of the podcast here. Starting off with Monday, Monday, the 16th of January, which is National Martin Luther King Jr. Day and is National Religious Freedom Day and International Hot and Spicy Food Day. As for in history, in 1547, Ivan IV, the terrible, crowned himself the first czar of Moscow. In 1793, the French King Louis XVI was sentenced to death during the French Revolution. In 1920, the first assembly of the League of Nations happened in Paris. And lastly, in 1938, the first jazz concert was held at Carnegie Hall with Benny Goodman performing. Nothing particular in birthdays. As for deaths, Monday in 2021, Phil Spector died. Tuesday, Tuesday, the 17th of January is National Classy Day and International Mentor Day. As for in history, in 1773, James Cook became the first to cross the Arctic Circle. In 1912, Robert Scott's expedition arrived at the South Pole. In 1920, the first day of prohibition of alcohol came into effect in the U.S. In 1946, the United Nations Security Council held its first meeting. In 1984, the Supreme Court ruled 5-4 to four that private use of VCRs to tape TV programs for later use did not violate federal copyright laws. In 1991, Operation Desert Storm began. And lastly, in 2007, the Doomsday Clock was set five minutes to midnight in response to North Korea's first nuclear test. As for birthdays, Tuesday was Benjamin Franklin's, Al Capone's, Betty White's, and Muhammad Ali's birthday, and is Jake Paul's 25th birthday. Wednesday, Wednesday, the 18th of January is National Thesaurus Day and Winning the Pooh Day. I have to admit, Thesaurus, those are fun. Everyone should have those. Those are super fun. If you're bored, you just kind of flip through them and find interesting words. For the Pilgrims in Boston reported the first UFO in the Americas. In 1788, the first fleet carrying 736 convicts from England to Australia stopped at Botany Bay to set up a penal colony. In 1943, the Soviets broke the siege of Leningrad by Nazi Germany. And then lastly, in 2016, the world's 26 richest people held wealth equal to half of the world's population. As for birthdays, Wednesday was Cary Grant's birthday. As for deaths, in 1862, President John Tyler passed away. Thursday, Thursday, the 19th of January. A little bit of a short one. It is National Popcorn Day. Yes, one of my favorite snacks. As for in history, in 1883, the first electric light system using overhead wires was built by Thomas Edison and began service in Russell, New Jersey. And lastly, in 2013, calcium deposits were discovered on Mars by the NASA's Curiosity rover. As for birthdays, Thursday was Robert E. Lee's and Edgar Allan Poe's birthday and is Dolly Barton's 78th birthday. Next, we move on to Friday, Friday the 20th of January, which is National Cheese Lovers Day. My goodness, they're getting me with all my favorite snacks. I love cheese. As for in history, in 1265, the first English parliament was summoned by royal command to Westminster Hall. In 1841, China seceded Hong Kong to the British during the First Opium War. In 1942, Nazi officials held the 1C conference in Berlin to organize the, quote, final solution. In 1945, Franklin D. Roosevelt was sworn in for an unprecedented fourth term as president. In 1981, Ronald Reagan was inaugurated as the 40th president. In 2008, Breaking Bad premiered. And lastly, in 2009, Barack Obama was inaugurated as the 44th president. 
As for birthdays, Friday was Buzz Aldrin's birthday. And as for deaths in 1993, Audrey Hepburn died. Saturday, Saturday, the 21st of January is National Squirrel Day and International Sweatpants Day. As for in history, in 1789, the first American novel was published called Power of Sympathy by H.W. Brown. In 1968, the Battle of Kisan happened. And lastly, in 2008, Black Monday happened worldwide to stock markets. As for birthdays, Saturday was Stonewall Jackson's birthday and is Jack Nicholson's 82nd birthday. As for deaths, in 1924, Vladimir Lenin died. In 1950, George Orwell died. And lastly, in 2022, Peggy Lee died. Sunday, Sunday, the 22nd of January is National Polka Dot Day. As for in history, in 1879, the Battle of Rokes Drift happened. And then lastly, in 1973, Roe v. Wade was passed by the U.S. Supreme Court. As for deaths, Sunday in 1973, Lyndon B. Johnson died. In 1995, Rose Fitzgerald Kennedy died. And lastly, in 2008, Heath Ledger died. Now for upcoming events, I'm going to read the timestamps for each town. That way you can jump to whichever town you're interested in, thus saving you time. Starting off with Boise at 13 minutes, 46 seconds. Meridian at 15 minutes, 40 seconds. Nampa at 16 minutes, 33 seconds. Caldwell at 18 minutes, 6 seconds. Marsing at 18 minutes, 33 seconds. Weezer at 18 minutes, 47 seconds. Eagle at 19 minutes, 19 seconds. Emmett at 21 minutes, 7 seconds. Twin Falls at 21 minutes, 56 seconds. Pocatello at 22 minutes, 43 seconds. Idaho Falls at 25 minutes, 28 seconds. Rexburg at 26 minutes, 41 seconds. McCall at 28 minutes, 4 seconds. Cascade at 29 minutes, 9 seconds. Lewiston at 29 minutes, 55 seconds. Moscow at 32 minutes, 2 seconds. Coeur d'Alene at 32 minutes, 48 seconds. Post Falls at 33 minutes, 32 seconds. Sandpoint at 34 minutes, 56 seconds. And The News at 35 minutes, 32 seconds. Boise. Boise, we have two city events here. Thursday, there's a Parks and Recreation Commission meeting at 4 p.m. at Boise City Hall. And then lastly, next Tuesday, January 24th, there is a City Council work session and meeting at Boise City Hall. The work session is at 3.30 p.m. and the meeting is at 6 p.m. As for performances, Friday, there is a Bronco Elite Gymnastics event at 9 a.m. at Idaho Central Arena. Check below for prices on that for tickets. I'm not sure if that was another typo there that it wasn't 9 a.m., but do check and reach out to them there. That's what they say is 9 a.m. Friday, there is a performance of the Perkings Acrobatics at 6.30 p.m. at the Morrison Center. Check below for prices on that. Then lastly, Saturday, there is Bring the Brahms event at 1 p.m. and 7.30 p.m. at the Morrison Center. Check below for prices. As for fun stuff, there is an exhibit called Slime at the Discovery Center. It is an exhibit covering about 3,000 square feet, teaching about non-Newtonian fluids. It ends February 5th. Then Saturday, there is a father-daughter dance from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. at St. Mary's School. Also Saturday, there is a British Cars and Coffee event at 9.30 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. at the Chow Public Market and Eatery. 
And then lastly, Sunday, the Boise Depot is open, has a open house and tours from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. The tours are from 12 to 1.30 p.m. As in other events, Tuesday, there is the grand opening of the Washington Floral Service from 7 a.m. to 12 p.m. at 8740 West Fairview Avenue. Also through Wednesday and Friday, there is the Idaho Agricultural Expo. And then lastly, Wednesday, there is a coffee and cop event from 12 p.m. to 1.30 p.m. at the Idaho Black History Museum. For more information on any of the things talked about, go to the Boise City website or check the links in the description below. Meridian, just one thing for city here. Tuesday, there may be a city council work session and meeting at City Hall. The work session, if it is to happen, will be at 4 p.m. and the meeting at 6 p.m. I know it's kind of close to the holiday thing, so I don't know if maybe they're just letting it run, but that's actually not happening. Do reach out to them and double check if you're interested in that. As for performances, Sunday, there is a comedy show from 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. at the Volume 1 Bar and Lounge. It is $21 a person. As in other events, Thursday, there is an open house at the Medical Arts Charter High School from 6 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. Then lastly, Saturday, there is a Night in Japan event from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. at the Meridian First Baptist Church. It is a dinner fundraiser. It is $12 to $15 a person. For more information about any of the things I talked about, go to the Meridian City website or check the link in the description below. Nampa got three city events here. Tuesday, there is a city council meeting from 5.30 p.m. to 10 p.m. at the council chambers. Then Thursday, there is a special city council workshop from 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. at the council chambers. And then lastly, next Tuesday, January 24th, there is a planning and zoning commission meeting at 6 p.m. at the council chambers. As in fun events, Saturday, there is the 12 Dancing Princesses from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. at the Nampa Civic Center. Then Thursday, there is a sledge ride and dinner event from 2 p.m. to 8 p.m. at 131 Constitution Way, Nampa. It is $100. They'll be doing a sledge ride and a Dutch oven dinner. That's all included in the cost plus transportation. Then Saturday, there is a cookie decorating event from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. at the Harward Rec Center. For members, it is $17, and for non-members, it is $20. Then also Saturday, there is a cake decorating, different than the cookie decorating, from 11.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. at the Harward Rec Center. It is $35 for members and $40 for non-members. Then next Tuesday, January 24th, there is a toddler cooking class from 11 a.m. to 11.45 a.m. at the Harward Rec Center. It is $28 for members and $33 for non-members. In other events, Saturday, there is a Red Cross lifeguard training from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. at the Harward Rec Center. It is $100 for members and $200 for non-members. For more information on anything I talked about, go to the Nampa City website or check the link in the description below. Caldwell, we've got a couple city events here. Tuesday, there is a city council meeting from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. at the Caldwell Police Station. Then Wednesday, there is a Mayor's Youth Advisory Council meeting from 5.30 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. at the Caldwell Police Station. Then lastly, next Tuesday, January 24th, there is a Design Review Commission meeting at 12 p.m. to 2 p.m. I didn't find any other events in Caldwell, so for more information about anything they talked about, go to the Caldwell City website. Marsing, you guys had an event here in performances. Thursday, there is a free community movie night at 7 p.m. at Legion Hall. It doesn't say what movie, but it's free, so you can't be that picky. For more information about what I talked about, go check the link in the description below. Weezer, same old, same old. In Fun Stuff, Wednesday, there is a 4-H game programming after-school series event from 4 p.m. to 5.30 p.m. at 116 West Idaho Street. They'll be learning about computer science while doing it through game programming. It is an ongoing event, and it is $35 for the program year. Not quite sure how that works. If you like pay, and then you get a year with them, or if you get to jump in, or you have to wait until they reset, I, I have no idea, so check with them on that. For more information about what I talked about, go to the link in the description below. Eagle, I don't have any other events besides City, so this is just going to be a really long bulk of City events here. Starting off with Tuesday, there is an Eagle Urban Renewal Agency meeting from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. at the Council Chambers. Also Tuesday, there is a public hearing on the Avimmer development at 6 p.m. at the Council Chambers. They'll be talking about the annexation and rezoning related to that. Also Tuesday, there is a special planning and zoning commission meeting at 6 p.m. to 11.50 p.m. at the council chambers. Then moving on to Wednesday, there is an Eagle Library board meeting from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. at the council chambers. 
Also Wednesday, there is a coffee with the mayor from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. at the council chambers. Moving to Thursday, there is a Parks Pathway and Recreation Commission meeting at 5.30 p.m. at the council chambers. Then moving on to next week, next Tuesday, January 24th, there is a city council meeting at 5.30 p.m. at City Hall. Also next Tuesday, January 24th, there is a public hearing on Carp Ranch Subdivision at 6 p.m. at the Council Chambers. The rest of these are all next Tuesday. Uh, there is a public hearing and fee schedule update at 6 p.m. at the Council Chambers. There is a public hearing on Cedar Creek Wealth at 6 p.m. at the Council Chambers. And there is a public hearing on Eagle on the Eagle Fire Station at 6 p.m. at the Council Chambers. And then there is a public hearing on Brookshire fencing waiver at 6 p.m. at the council chambers. Like the rest of them, next Tuesday, January 24th, there is a public hearing on Butler fencing waiver at 6 p.m. at the council chambers. For more information about anything that I talked about, go to the Eagle City website to check those things out. CUNA, really short. There's just nothing. Um, I don't have it in the timestamp readout, but if you actually come across it in here, there's just, there's nothing. Um, yeah, nothing. But as for Emmett, there is some stuff here. As for city, next Tuesday, January 4th, there is a city council meeting from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. I assume that's at City Hall, but they don't state where it's at, so you might want to reach out to them on that. As for fun stuff, Thursday, there is a Gem County Christian Homeschoolers game day from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. at the 10th Street Ball and RV Park with the covered picnic area, according to their listing. In other events, Tuesday, there is a beginner wire weaving class at 6 p.m. at the Grateful Garden Art Studio. And then lastly, Friday, there is a ribbon cutting ceremony for Rose Jewelry Company Store from 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. at 123 West Main Street. For more information on any things I talked about, go to the Emmett City website or check the links in the description below. Twin Falls, not a lot here, but as for in city events, Tuesday, there is a city council meeting at 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. Wednesday, there is an urban renewal agency meeting from 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. Then next Monday, January 23rd, there is a city council meeting from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. Then next Tuesday, January 24th, there is a planning and zoning commission meeting from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. All these, as you could already guess, don't have a location. It was not stated on their site and stuff. I'm assuming that's at just city hall but they don't say it like they should for all their events and stuff. But there is one other thing. In performances Saturday, there is a comedy night event at 7 p.m. at the Wilson Theater. Check below for prices on that. For more information about anything we talked about, go to the Twin Falls City website or check the link in the description below. Pocatello, ton of city events like usual, so we'll crack right into it. City, Tuesday, there is a Chamber of Commerce meeting from 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. at the Glean Coffee Roasters. Then also Tuesday, there is a CDBG Advisory Committee meeting from 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. at City Hall. Also Tuesday, there is a site planning review meeting at 1.30 p.m. to 3 p.m. at City Hall. And then lastly, Tuesday, there is a library board meeting from 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. at the Marshall Public Library. Moving on to Wednesday, there is a housing alliance and committee partnership meeting from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. at Christensen's Court. Also Wednesday, there is a Historic Preservation Commission meeting from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. at City Hall. Then next Monday, January 23rd, there is a Mayor's Youth Advisory Council meeting from 3.15 p.m. to 4.30 p.m. at City Hall. Then moving on to next Tuesday, January 24th, there is an Investment and Audit Committee meeting from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. at City Hall. Also next Tuesday, January 24th, there is a Site Planning Review meeting from 1.30 p.m. to 3 p.m. at City Hall. And lastly, next Tuesday, January 24th, there is a Chamber of Commerce meeting from 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. The location is not stated, so you might need to reach out with them on that. As for performances, Wednesday to Thursday, there is the 2023 Idaho Potato Conference at the Idaho State University Student Union Building. It is $40 a ticket. Thursday, there is a men's basketball versus Sacramento State from 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. Friday, there is a Chocolate Lovers Affair from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. at the Stevens Performing Arts Center. It is $20 a ticket. Looks like that one's a fair for chocolate and stuff, so if you'd like to get something kind of sweet, maybe go there. And then lastly, Saturday, there is a men's basketball game versus Portland. As for fun stuff, Tuesday, there is a book club meeting from 6.30 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. at the Moco Madness. Also Tuesday, there is a science trivia event from 6.30 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. at Jim Dandy Brewing. It is for grades between 5th and 8th. 
Then Thursday, there is a family game night from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. at the Pond Student Union. For students, it is free, and for guests, it is $15 a guest. And then Friday, there is an adults-only skating night from 10 p.m. to 11.50 p.m. at the Delta Skating. In other events, Tuesday, there is an advanced techniques for furnishings from 6 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. at the Elwyn Cottage. And then lastly, Wednesday, there is a team roping event from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. at the Bannock County Event Center. For more information on anything talked about, go to the Pocatello City website or check the link in the description below. Idaho Falls, nothing for city, but in performances, Tuesday, there is a jazz performance at 7 p.m. at 435A Street, Idaho Falls. Then Saturday, there is the Idaho Falls Spud Kings are playing against the Vernal Oilers at 7.05 p.m. at 1690 Event Center Drive, Idaho Falls. Tickets are $20 a person. As for fun stuff, Thursday, there is an annual Robert Burns Supper at 6 p.m. at the Arbor. There's going to be live Scottish music and poetry, plus some food. Tickets are $50 a person. In other events, Wednesday, there is the 2023 Organic Gardening Class from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. This week, it's going to be going over healthy soil. Then Saturday, there is an Embroidery Club event from 10.30 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. at the Jones So and VAC. Check for times and prices below. Also Saturday, there is a Junior Markets event from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. at 109 West 17th Street, Idaho Falls. It is an event for entrepreneurs between the ages of 6 and 14 years old. For more information about anything things talked about, go to the Idaho Falls City website or check the link in the description below. Rexburg, nothing for city, but we have some stuff here for performances and some other categories. Saturday, there is an extended play of Back to the Future at Romance Theater. It is at 6.30 p.m. They will be having Back to the Future trivia, treats, activities, prizes, dress up, and dancing, plus the extended version of the movie. As for fun stuff, Tuesday, there is an art exploration event at 3 p.m. for kids at City Hall. It is put on by the Rexburg Arts. You'll need to register for that. Also, Tuesday, there is an event called Creative Corner. It is at 4.30 p.m. at City Hall. It is for youth ages 5 to 12. You will need to register for that as well. Thursday, there is an intro to watercolor class for adults at 7 p.m. at City Hall. Obviously needing to register for that. And also Thursday, there is an intro to improv class for adults at 7.30 p.m. at the Romance Theater. Also, we'll need to register. In other events, Wednesday, there is a musical theater for kids at 4.30 p.m. at the Romance Theater is for kids between the ages of 8 and 11. Also Wednesday, there is a musical theater for adults at 5.30 p.m. at the Romance Theater. And then lastly for Wednesday, there is a musical theater for teens at 5.30 p.m. at the Romance Theater. And then Thursday, there is an open studio for adults at City Hall at 10 a.m. We'll need to register for that. For more information on anything to talk about, go to the Rexburg City website or check the link in the description below. McCall got two city events here. Tuesday, there is a redevelop agency meeting at 8 a.m. at Legion Hall. And then Wednesday, there is a recreation advisory committee meeting at 6 p.m. at Legion Hall. As for performances Friday and Sunday, there is the McCall Mountaineers High School Hockey Tournament. They don't give times, but it is at 200 East Lake Street, McCall. And then Saturday, there is an event called Meet the Mushers from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. at the Ponderosa Center. They will be having some of the mushers from the Idaho sled team there, plus some goodies. As for fun stuff, Wednesday, there is Yahtzee from 5.30 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. at Bistro 45. And there is cross-country skiing and snowshoeing at the Meadow Creek Golf Resort at 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. For adults, the day pass is $10, and for youth, it is $5. It is ongoing until April 30th. And in other events, the grand opening of the Natural Grocers is at 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. at 209 North 3rd Street, McCall. For more information on anything talked about, go to the McCall City website or check the link in the description below. Cascade, we've got some stuff here for performances. Saturday, there is the 2023 Idaho Sled Dog Challenge at Lake Cascade Boat Access Park Lot. It will be going on until February 1st. As for fun stuff, Friday, there is a dinner from 5 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. at American Legion. 
Also Friday, there is a swing dance class from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. It is free for all ages to attend. It will be happening at the Valley Club building. It will be on country dance and line dancing. If you have any questions, call Steve at 208-861-8486. And then also Friday, there is bingo at the Senior Center this Friday from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. For more information about anything talked about, go to the Cascade City website or check the link in the description below. Lewiston got a couple things here for city. Tuesday, there is an emergency medical service advisory board meeting from 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. at the Lewiston Fire Department. Also Tuesday, there is an airport authority board meeting from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. at the Lewiston Airport Administration Building. Then Wednesday, there is a library board meeting from 5.30 p.m. to 7 p.m. at the Lewiston Library. Also Wednesday, there is a 2023 Transportation Capital Improvement Plan open house meeting from 5.30 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. at the Lewiston Library. Next Monday, January 23rd, there is a city council meeting from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. at the Lewiston Library. And then lastly, next Tuesday, January 24th, there is a cemetery slash urban forestry commission meeting from 5.30 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. at 1424 Main Street, Lewiston. As for fun events, Tuesday, there is the Tuesday at the library from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. They will have snacks and there will also be a Smash Bros. video game tournament plus some other fun stuff. Wednesday, there is Wiggles and Giggles event from 11 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. at the Lewiston Library. Thursday, there is Quilting with Coral from 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. at the Lewiston Library. Also Thursday, there is an Art Now Learning Lab from 4.30 p.m. to 5.30 p.m. at the Lewiston Library. And then lastly, Thursday, there is a board game night from 5 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. at the Lewiston Library. All ages and families are welcome to attend. In other events, Tuesday, there is the first part of a houseplant cure and propagation class from 5.30 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. at the Lewiston Library. Wednesday, there is a junior master gardening learning lab from 4.30 p.m. to 5.30 p.m. at the Lewiston Library. Then Thursday, there is a girls STEM club meeting from 4.30 p.m. to 5.30 p.m. at the Lewiston Library. And lastly, on Saturday, there's a crocheting class from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. at the Lewiston Library. It is free. For more information about anything talked about, go to the Lewiston City website or check the link in the description below. Moscow got a couple things here. As for performances, Wednesday, there is the Moscow School Board Meeting and Greeting at 6.30 p.m. at the Moscow Chamber of Commerce. Then Saturday, there is a Martin Luther King Human Rights Community Breakfast from 9.30 a.m. to 11 a.m. Then Saturday, there is a comedy night event from 7 p.m. to 12 a.m. It is $20 a person, and they will have three comedians performing. As for fun stuff, Saturday and Sunday, there is a gun show from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. at... 1021 Harold Street, Moscow, H A R O L D. Admission is $9 a person. For more information about anything talked about, go to the Moscow City website or check the link in the description below. Coeur d'Alene just got a couple city events here. Tuesday, there is a city council meeting at 6 p.m. at the library. Then Friday, there is an urban forestry community meeting at 8 a.m. at City Hall. Then next Monday, January 23rd, there is a general service slash public works committee meeting at 12 p.m. at the council chambers. Also next Monday, January 23rd, there is a parks and recreation commission meeting at 5.30 p.m. at the library. Lastly, Monday, next Monday, January 23rd, there is a child care commission meeting at 6.30 p.m. at City Hall. And lastly, next Tuesday, January 24th, there is an Arts Commission meeting at 4 p.m. at City Hall. For more information on anything talked about, go to the Coeur d'Alene City website or check the link in the description below. Post Falls got three things for City. Tuesday, there is a City Council workshop and meeting at City Hall. The workshop is from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. and the meeting is from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Then Thursday, there is an Urban Renewal Agency meeting from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. at City Hall. And then lastly, next Tuesday, January 24th, there is a Parks and Recreation Commission meeting at 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. at City Hall. As per performances, Saturday, there is a comedy show from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. at the Draft Zone. There will be three comedians, and the show is rated 21+. plus. Tickets are $15 a person. Chansey Williams will be performing at 6 p.m. at Nashville North. And fun events, Saturday, there is a winter craft event from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. at Ace Hardware. It is free for everyone. They will also have drinks and uh, some winter-themed crafts to do. 
In other events, Tuesday, there is how to make a Vienna apple strudel class from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. at the Jacqueline Arts and Cultural Center. It is $58 a student. And then Saturday, there is an enhanced concealed carry class at 9 a.m. at Cabela's. I think you need to sign up, but check out, check for that. I didn't see if there was any sign up link or whatever else, but do check and reach out to them to see if you need to sign up for that. For more information about anything talked about, go to the Post Falls City website or check the link in the description below. Sam Point, last one here. As for performances, Wednesday, there is a live piano with Bob Bedling from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. at 301 Cedar Street. Then Friday, there is a Bright Moment Jazz from 4.30 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. at 100 North 1st Avenue, Sandpoint. Now, there's a lot of other music events happening this week, and I didn't want to try to go through all of them. So if you're interested, check the link in the description below and see if any of them float your boat and you want to go to them. For more information about what I just talked about, go below and check the link in the description. Moving on into the news, we have our first story here, Givens Hot Spring Roof Collapse. This comes by KTVB7 by Jude Binkley. So I've actually been to this hot springs, and I assume many of you in the Treasure Valley have as well. The roof over the pool at the Givens Hot Spring collapsed last Saturday around 1.45 p.m. There were between 15 to 20 people in the pool, ranging from ages 9 to 70 when it collapsed. As of the writing of this, no one is dead, but officials say six people were taken to the hospital and one additional person was transported via a private vehicle. The first deputy to report arrived at the spring 11 minutes after the first 911 call was placed. The Murphy Quick Response Unit, Murphy Fire, Marsing Ambulance Service, and Sheriff's Office were all responding to it. For anyone that left the Givens Hot Springs before the police arrived is asked to call 208-495-1154. The owners stated in an interview later that they knew the roof was getting weak and were actually in town buying parts for it when it collapsed. For now, they're going to remove the roof completely and have it open, but they hope to later add a roof back over it. Lastly, the sheriff's office said the agencies that responded were 100% volunteer and they are thankful, quote, for their quick response to the scene and their professionalism. One thing I forgot to kind of add in my script here is that once they get that cover, the roof kind of completely removed, they're going to be reopening. That way they just have an open top, hot springs and everything for people to join in. But at some point they're hoping to put a roof back over the top of it. But it is really, really sad to hear, kind of really surprising to hear about the amount of people that were in the pool and different stuff. Thankfully, I guess in theory that like if the roof fell on top of people and they were in the water that that would have helped like cushion the blow or something, but then it also becomes danger of drowning and different issues there. But it's I'm very, very happy to hear and I bet most of you are very, very happy to hear that no one died, that it was only minor injuries and things, but hopefully they can keep afloat and the business can keep going because it is quite a cool hot springs. I really want to set that straight that when I've gone, I've always really enjoyed it and it's been nice. The, the biggest thing is just it's a very old place. Um, it probably needed the roof changed a little quicker than this and maybe their judgment I don't know it'll be interesting to see if any lawsuits or different things come down the line if it was their fault or if it was like an extreme circumstance or whatever it may have been but I hope the business stays around and if there's learning to be done that the owners or whoever learns the lesson that they need to learn so that something like this doesn't quite happen again Next one here is Handmade Idaho has a store in the mall. This comes by the Boise Dev by Autumn Robertsons. So I didn't know about this company, but maybe some of you have. But there's a small business called Homemade Idaho. They first opened as a pop-up store at the Village in Meridian in 2020. They specialize in products from local artists in the area and other small businesses in Idaho. Kind of like Wear Boise and Banana Inc. They have a range of stuff like jewelry, apparel, and other small products. They now have a permanent store in the Boise Mall and a website where you can go buy those products. So even if you're outside of Boise, you can still buy their stuff, which I think this is really cool. More local stuff. I mean, which is kind of obvious me being on a podcast called Local Yokel Idaho that I would like local stuff. But yeah, this this is still really cool to see. I didn't know they existed. So 
it's nice that, you know, it's kind of funny how that happens when you have a more permanent store and a permanent stuff that you kind of grow and your influence, the amount of people that can come see you rather than something more temporary. It's sad. It'd be nice if all of us were just like, oh yeah, look, here's a temporary thing and we're all excited. But you know, sometimes you need kind of a physical brick and mortar to build that kind of reputation and stuff, but still cool to see. I intend to drop in. I will admit when I was reading the article, they didn't just have jewelry or apparel or little trinkets. It seemed like they had some more bigger products, more interesting kind of things. It almost almost reminds me of like um, a thrift store or somewhere where people just kind of like, hey, can you sell this for me? And then they have it. So I mean, who, who knows if you're someone here in Idaho that has some cool product or thing that you think would sell well and people really like, you might be able to approach them and they might take you up on that offer, which would be really cool. But in any case, next time I drop by the mall, I'll probably drop in and see it. New woodworking shop. This comes by the Boise Dev by Anna Daly. This one I'm really excited about, and I think some of you will be too. So for those of you that want to get into woodworking or know nothing about it and live in the Treasure Valley, there's a new business opening that you might find very useful. It's called the Maker Shop. It is located off Overland and Cole Road in Boise. It is a 7,000 square foot workshop that they have everything that a woodworker might want. Power tools, CNC router, table saws, and many other things. As for how you pay for this, it's kind of like a gym. You pay for a month, three months, annual membership, plus there's a seven day or day pass. The difference between it and a gym is the fact that there are people on staff to teach you how to use the machines and to help you with whatever project you're working on. Plus they have classes and other parts of the membership that you can go on that will teach you how to make different things and stuff, some pre-made stuff, other things kind of working with you. All in all, it's very, very similar to the Boise Bicycle Project, just more about wood. Granted, one catch is you have to be older than 18 to work at the woodworking shop. Granted, the owner, Jared, said that they would like to make it an open space for everyone, including those under 18. All in all, a super interesting idea and a dream come true for some people trying to learn woodwork. I know for myself, I've always kind of wanted to tinker with it and stuff and learn it. And it's kind of hard because you got to get this stuff and that equipment. And then you're kind of burning through wood and different stuff, which I think with this, you're going to have to pay for wood. I wasn't sure when I was reading the article, but all in all, I really am excited about this. And I mentioned this to some of my family and they might even end up going there because it's nice. You know, it takes away a lot of the upfront difficulties that you might have with woodworking and have people there that you can pay and they can kind of help you and walk you through the process. Just kind of like the Boise Bicycle Project sounds really similar, but just more focused around wood, which is cool. But as for the 18 thing, that kind of makes sense. I could understand that because you've got a lot of like spinning bits and things that are meant to cut stuff and the liability for people under the age of 18 and different things. It, it sadly makes sense in the world that we live in with the legalese and everything. But all in all, hopefully you'll go check it out. I know I'll probably maybe drop by sometime and look at it, but I think it's a really, really cool thing and I think they'll do really, really well. Next one is a little bit of a sad one. CUNA Rodeo Cancelled. This comes by KTVB7 by Sydney Kid. Last Tuesday, it was announced that the CUNA city is pulling out of the rodeo that they do there. The problem started with the city and Crooked 8 saying that they were parting ways and both making their own competing rodeos. When this was announced, the city got many negative emails, social media replies, and other people at city council meetings being upset. The city said they ended up getting even some threats of violence towards the city and the staff running the rodeo. Mayor Joe Steer said, quote, I don't even know how to say anything about the folks that are making death threats over the rodeo. I don't really know how to respond to that, Steer told Idaho Press. When it gets to that point, I'm just not willing to put my staff out there for that kind of abuse, end quote. The reason for the breakup between the city and Crooked 8 was because the city wanted to find a permanent city-owned place that they could be used for the rodeo and other events. This surprised the owners of Crooked 8, but it sounds like they understood and are still standing with the city, quote, It is completely unacceptable. That's not the horsemen way. We're stewards of the land, we're stewards of the animals, and we're stewards of our relationships but they're still going ahead with their separate rodeo. All in all, kind of sad to see the kind of stuff that go on there. I mean, it's just it's just a rodeo. I mean, maybe there's a lot of money tied up somewhere, but if there was a lot of money tied up, I feel like that would be at Crooked 8, and they would have invested interest and in wanting to have this all break up or whatever else, but it seems like Crooked 8, they're standing with the city and agreeing with them, and so I don't quite know, you know, why, why someone would go this far. It... Uh, I know nostalgia can be a very powerful thing at times with people because they're all used to the usual venue where it's at and they don't want it to change, whatever else. 
and liking to have like a one centralized source and then this would break it up. I get that, but death threats and other stuff and violence such as that, I don't really think that's a good idea. Nowhere near the response. I have to agree with the mayor here. I personally don't understand why someone would quite go that far about it. It doesn't say something about you. It doesn't say something about, you know, your faith or other political leanings. It's just that the city wants to have a more permanent structure that they can do stuff at. And then they wanted to then also be able to roll that into something. So the budgeting and everything could be tied up in one spot. And so they decided to part ways with their partner. And yeah, their partner, Kirk Date, was a little surprised at the changes that occurred and everything, but they were also understanding and stood with the city on that matter. But, you know, then you could have had two rodeos and you could have had some cool competition and maybe the Crooked Eight got like better uh, people playing for them and doing different stuff and performances and then the CUNA city backed one didn't and then you would have naturally seen a progression over or maybe it happened the other way and then that one would die out and then you go to that. I, I just don't understand. I mean, if you want to see some more quotes and get into a little bit of the nitty gritty, you can check the article down below, but this is just not good and it's kind of sad to hear, but at least there is one rodeo. I will point that out if I didn't make that clear in the article or if I didn't make that clear on my script. There is going to be the Crooked 8 rodeo. They're still going ahead with that. The only thing is that the city backed one is not going to be going ahead. The city is backing out of doing their separate one. But to lighten up the mood, here's a little bit of a positive one. New chicken chain coming to Boise. This comes by the Boise Dev by Donde. So lately, I think all of us have noticed the popularity of chicken lately growing faster in the fast food brand. For example, the conversation around Chick-fil-A versus Popeye's chicken sandwiches. So why not add one more to the mix? A chicken chain by the name of Guthrie's Chicken is planning on opening a location across from the Vista Village in Boise. As for what they're selling, it's pretty simple. Chicken in a couple different ways with fries, coleslaw, and some other classic southern drinks such as sweet tea or lemonade, kind of like Chick-fil-A. They're not a super small chain either. They have signed on to add 50 locations across Arizona, Colorado, Idaho, Nevada, and New Mexico. So all in all, cool to see. I intend to drop by because I will admit I love Chick-fil-A and chicken sandwiches in general. So it'll be interesting to see what their take on it is if they put more bread in. Because I think the biggest thing you could say about chicken sandwiches is that you can kind of get good quality chicken because like Popeye's chicken and Chick-fil-A's chicken, the quality of the meat itself is really good. But then the breading is really where it comes down to it that I think you can get into preferences. I like less breading on my chicken and stuff. So I like Chick-fil-A's, but I hear Popeye's has like more breading on it. It'll be interesting to see what they do with that. If it's more or if it's kind of, I know some places I've had chicken sandwiches, it's more like chunky, if that makes sense, that there's more on it, but it's not like flaky, it's chunky. Really interesting to see. And I intend to drop by and maybe you will as well. Another small business story here. Idaho Soap Company has a new manufacturing facility. This comes by the Boise Dev by Anna Daly. I didn't know about this company, but you all might. The Idaho Soap Company used to have a store open in the Indian Creek Plaza in Caldwell. Now has a storefront and manufacturing facility in Eagle now. The new location will allow people to come in, buy different soaps and stuff, and also see it being made. They set up a window there that you can look into the establishment and see the process as the soap is being made. If you're interested, the soaps use natural ingredients and take inspiration from Idaho, as the name implies. For example, some of the types of soaps are like huckleberry scented or have shapes or stamps that are that of Idaho of the mountains or the sawtooth or different things. Additionally, you can find their stuff at Albertsons, DMB, and some other places which I think is really cool. I might drop in. I don't know. I'm not a big soap person. I know some people really get into that and kind of the scented stuff and candles and wax and all that everything. It's not my biggest thing, but it does sound really cool. And you might find it interesting if you're ever over there in Eagle to drop by and see their stuff. And plus, you know, maybe a cool little educational thing to do with the kids to go in and see them making the soap in the process. And you could ask them and learn about it. New pizza store opening up in CUNA. This comes by the Boise Dev by Gretchen Parsons. Last Tuesday, Pyology Pizzeria opened its first location at 1327 North Meridian Road. The pizzas they serve is artisan style pizza. The way you order the pizza is very similar to how you order pizza at like Blaze Pizza. They are a California based company that was founded in 2011. They have a couple locations, but this will be their newest one. If you're curious about what an artisan style pizza means, it's a pizza that's made fresh by hand and with high quality ingredients, which this sounds nice, pretty cool. If I'm ever over in CUNA and I have some friends and stuff, probably drop in and stuff. I know I really enjoy Blaze Pizza. I've heard some other one. I 
can't remember the name of it. There's some other pizza type of place that's kind of like Blaze Pizza that is open in Boise. I think it's only in Boise that people have recommended me, and I need to go try that. I, I can't remember the name for the life of me, but this is cool to see this one. Hopefully, it'll become kind of a uh, staple over there in CUNA and everyone enjoys it. You'll have to let me know. If you if you go and try it and you're over there in CUNA, then yeah, send me a message on Twitter or email or whatever, and let me know. What'd you think of it? Was it good? Was it bad? Next story is work happening at the Broncos Stadium. This comes by the Boise Dev by Don Day. If you remember the past couple of weeks, BSU Stadium and BSU Sports Department has been getting quite a lot of money and ideas. Well, we see some of the fruits of this funding and ideas. In late December, crews started building a scaffolding in the south end zone or near it, not in it. Mon might be asking, what are they doing? Well, they're building a support for a large screen. The screen will be 100 and 20 feet wide and 50 feet tall and it's going to cost about 4.5 million when all is said and done they were hoping to have it up for the 2022 season but that didn't happen according to the boise state spokesperson mike sharp quote i'm told the support structure will be wrapped up in the next two weeks and the rest of the install is roughly a six-week process with that said it means it will be done in time for the may 20th concert that will be happening there at the stadium which will be quite cool it's interesting to see them putting up putting this up and everything hopefully it adds to the game and doesn't take away from it it would be kind of funny i really hope it doesn't happen but it'd be funny if like a football went astray and someone actually hit it i don't know if they're gonna what um, height or whatever they're going to have it at, if it's just going to be so high that you'd have to be absurdly strong and capable to throw. I don't know. But it would be cool to see. I wonder if they're using, if it's like OLED or if it's a projector system that they're using. I know someone could say, well, what about projectors? It's crazy what they can do with projectors. Like, you ever watch those tech events where they have those big displays up and they're talking about the tech and they're like in a big stadium or whatever? Those are projectors. I, I went and looked it up. It's crazy. That's actually a projector. That's not an LED or a screen built in the wall. It's actually a projector, which it, it blew my brain. So I've at this point not written off projectors for big screens, but who knows? It might be that um, I'm going to guess it's probably going to be one of those big LED panels. What I mean by that is they have like squares and then each one of the squares has literally individual LEDs. But because the display is like so big, they the, the pixels in that sense can be so big as well. And so they just have that and then it makes it easier for it to stand up in the storm and the weather and different stuff. And it just works, which if that's the case, that's super cool as well. But it'll be interesting to see. Next one is Bogus Basin Skier Rescue. This comes by KTVB7 by staff. Last Monday, a man was caught in a small avalanche on the backside of Bogus Basin. 15 members of the Idaho Mountain Search and Rescue Unit found that he had traveled outside the bounds at dark, ended up in a backcountry canyon. The Bogus Basin Ski Patrol team and the Boise County Sheriff's Office helped in the search for locating him. The lost skier was found in an area of significant avalanche risk, so the Idaho National Guard was brought in to try to hoist him out, but the aircraft was unable to due to the heavy fog that we kind of had earlier this week. He was finally rescued by a Bogus Basin snowcat. Thankfully, the man was not injured in the avalanche. I guess this might be a example of warning to stay within the bounded areas and safe i mean especially this year because we've got a lot more snow and i've heard i think i talked about it last week maybe i did maybe i researched it and i didn't put it in here but there's a lot of avalanche risk happening just because of the amount of snow which is good i'd, I'd rather i'd rather have more snow and the avalanche risk than less snow and no avalanche risk because we need the snow and everything to fill everything back up and stuff and not go into drought things and that's not fun um, but it is kind of cool. If you want to, I would actually highly recommend jumping over to the article there. They have some really cool photos of the snow cat and then the process that they were doing. And then the, I think the last one was like a photo. I couldn't tell what it was. Like they had some skiers or they were snowshoeing or whatever. And it was out at night and the photo is a little shaky and grainy, but still really pretty to like see the stars and then the snow and everything up there. But really glad to hear that he was not injured and they were able to find him and get to him. But man, it sounds like a very huge, laborious, time-consuming process. And I really hope the guy had some insurance to cover that because I have no doubt that was not free. Then again, who knows? That might go to the taxpayer. I, I don't know. But anywho... Next one is exciting for all you art people out there. Ceramica is back. This comes by the Boise Dev by Gretchen Persons. Short, but still great to hear. We talked about this a couple weeks back, if I remember correctly. But Ceramica, for those that don't know, is a pottery studio where you get to make your own pottery and stuff. And they have a kiln and you get to decorate it however you want. Well, back in November, the business announced that it would be closing for good. But in December, they got a new owner that wanted to take the business, quote, we are ecstatic to announce that we have entered into a contract for the sale of Ceramica and the buyers couldn't be better qualified to take Ceramica to the next level. This came from their Facebook page. 
The reopening party was last Saturday, and they are still, if you're for any of those that are curious, are still in the Vista Village, which I'm really glad to hear. It was sad to hear with the original reports when it sounded like they would close, but it's glad to hear they're back. I know there was a lot of people that really enjoyed it. I did it a couple times. I wasn't big into doing the kiln and like everything and stuff, but still a really cool idea because at the end of the day, you get a product that you get to use, be it a mug or whatever else, especially great for like Father's Day or Mother's Day when you want to make something with care and then you have people there to help you and everything. Just really great idea. I'm glad it didn't go away. I know there's probably some other places in the valley, if I can think of my top of my head, that are around, but they seem to be the biggest one. I'm glad we didn't lose them. I'm glad they're back and I hope the no new owners will bring the business to grow and grow and do even better. I swear, this is the last new chain thing. New chain here in Idaho coming to Boise. This comes by the Boise Dev by Don Day. Another restaurant is moving into the Treasure Valley. The name of it is Nararama Yuzakaya. It will be opening up at the corner of Bound and East Riverwalk Drive in Boise. The chain is small. This will be their fourth location, but they also have one in Twin Falls for those that are interested over there. Now, you probably might be asking, well, what do they serve? Well, that's where the interesting part comes in. The menu is made up of a couple different ramen options, from simple things like pork and chicken-based ramen to even more exotic dishes containing shrimp or even octopus, plus bobo and Thai tea and some gluten-free options, which this sounds really cool. I know I don't go to a ton of Asian restaurants and stuff because I have a couple friends that are Asian. It's just more enjoyable to have their home cooking and spend time and all that with them than to go out. But this, this does sound really cool. I might have to drop in or recommend to go with some friends and family. You might want to check it out. Um, when I was reading the article, I couldn't tell if they were open or if they're in the process. It sounds like they've already gone through like the business commissioner. I can't remember the name for it, but like the Boise department that gives them sign off on buildings and whatever else. Like my brain is blanking it at the moment. Um, but it sounds like they already got the sign off on that, but they will need to do a couple changes to the restaurant and location and other stuff. So I'm guessing they're not open yet. And I didn't see any time in the article that said when they would be open. So I guess just keep an eye on that area for a Google Maps listing, or maybe if I get an article, I'll put it in the quickies or something when they do open, if that gets written. But still, really cool idea, like a whole restaurant based around ramen and for those in Twin Falls even, you can try it right now. Or those in Boise can drive over to Twin Falls and you can check it out. I guess if you're there in Twin Falls, have you tried it? Did you know it existed? Let me know. Did you like it? Did you not like it? Or can you go and try it out and let me know what you think? Next one is Large Subdivision starting in Donnelly. This comes by the Boise Dev by Autumn Robertsons. So there is a 80 acre, 124 lot subdivision that is trying to be put in. If it works out, it would be located off Tamarack Falls Road and South Northwood Road. With that said, the project has a little bit of history, but the local community had concerns over the way the water management was and the amount of traffic the subdivision would add to the area. They signed a 48 signature appeals letter to overturn the decision by the Planning and Zoning Commission. The Boise-based KM Engineering is working on the project and they gave a rebuttal on these concerns at the hearing that occurred. They said that the improvements that are being added would improve and make things better with the drainage and would also capture sediment that is currently going into the Cascade Lake nearby. They also said that the subdivision would not have an environmental effect because the subdivision will be using sewer instead of wells or septic systems that would leak into the surrounding areas. With that said, the Valley Court Commission is moving forward with the project after hearing appeals. If you want to see some more of the quotes and the back and forth, you can check the article in the description below. I didn't want to go too in-depth with it and everything because I know I might give a spin or stuff and that's kind of like when we get into these cases where there was like two parties kind of warring back and forth. I try to whittle it down to just the facts that I can try to find. Okay, this happened. They said this. Here's the rebuttal. Here was their concerns, yada, yada. And then if you guys are really interested, you can go and look at the really big back and forth partly due to the amount of time I've got to work on this and then also partly due to the fact that I know that if I try to say it, I might get the tone wrong or I might misconstrue it or have my own opinions about it or different stuff. And so I don't really want to go into that. When I was reading it on my opinion half of this, I think the the people gave a, gave a good argument for their concerns because they were worried about drainage stuff and environmental effects and especially the traffic and different things, which is an understandable element. But on the flip side, listening to the quotes that the engineering company gave, it sounds like it really sounds like it won't be a big issue in the amount of stuff that they've engineered. Granted, I'm not looking at their exact plans. Same thing. I think it was the board member for the zoning commission and everything said she was looking at that and wasn't seeing a problem with it like the people were seeing. Granted, I could see some people being frustrated about the traffic and 
to that, I understand. I don't like the traffic. I mean, I just was out driving a day or two ago in the evening coming back from an event, and it just kind of was sad to be driving through Nampa and Caldwell and see the amount of stuff that's building up where I remember driving before and seeing fields of wheat or corn or whatever else and small farmhouses now having tons of businesses and four-lane roads and stuff, and it, it can be sad. I get it. It's not fun. It's not happy, and we love our rural Idaho, and we love what it is. We don't want it to change. But on the other hand, a lot of the cool things that we get with other businesses and improvements and federal funding and all these other stuff that we're excited about and different stuff come because of that growth and we can't stop it. We can't tell people they can't live here. That would be mean. I would agree. And I don't think it's a good thing to have that we need to be able to let them in, but we need to let know how to grow properly. I think it's not bad to add those subdivisions in, but we need to add them in as the infrastructure is capable, not overworking ourselves or should I say over adding the amount of things that we can support with our current infrastructure and everything but that gets into other stuff. Anywho, it'll be interesting to see if they have any more issues that come up, but it sounds like that subdivision is going to continue going forward with its trajectory and building up there. Next one is a little bit more upbeat Mullen library open. This comes by the Shoshone press by Molly Roberts. For those in Mullen, you're probably aware of this, but the doors at the library there have been closed since August. But good news, this last Friday, they opened back up. The library has a new board of trustees, a new library director, and an assistant librarian. It also appears to have added a fictional section, a young adult section, and plus some more kid-friendly stuff, and a ton of other resources on Idaho and local history to kind of keep people connected with that local community there in the state, which, you know, for me, I'm always in support of. For those outside of Mullen, the library opened up in 1920 and was funded by the Morning Mine to help miners and the community. The building is three stories and it contains the library, a bowling alley, which I thought that was kind of cool that you've got the two together that I could go read a book and then go downstairs to the bowling alley and then back up. I always thought that was crazy. And then a multi-purpose room that has like a stage and everything. I will admit, I would highly recommend looking at the photos and I even like jumped on a Google Street View to see what it kind of looks like currently compared to the old photo they had. And it's still a really pretty library. I honestly kind of like the blue paint that they show in the article that was originally on there. I think the photo was taken in like 1920 when it opened or maybe in 1930. I don't know. I kind of like the old look, but then again, I'm sucker for old things. <laughs> but um, still a really pretty town. I might actually be tempted after I get done with doing the podcast this week, this Saturday, to jump on some Google Street View and go around the town and honestly want to visit now because I love libraries and I love the cool stuff. And especially this, the idea of having the library and then the bowling alley in it is super cool and exciting. And I know you guys are probably all excited up there to have the library open as well, because I would, because books, so much fun to read. But we'll move on to the next one here. This next one is short but quick. I could have put it in the quickies, but I decided to put it in here. Free National Park Days. This comes by East Idaho News by Forrest Brown. So this year, the U.S. National Park Service is offering five days out of the year that entrance fees to 63 national parks will be waived. The first of these days will actually be this Monday, January 16th for Martin Luther King Day. The other four are April 22nd, August 4th, September 23rd, and November 11th. To see what parks are free on those days and other details, you can check the link in the description below. But I think this is really cool. I didn't even know they do this. I don't know if this was like just this year, a new idea or program that they're putting in. But I think this is awesome to have. And then I'm probably going to put this on my calendar and you should too. So that if you're on a trip or something, you can kind of maybe plan your trip around it. That if there's a really cool national park that usually would be expensive or different stuff, that it will be free on that day. And then you can save a little bit of money and plan your trip around it. That, you know, if you've got a trip in August or September or maybe even early April, then you could fit that in. I know this is like January 16th one one could say here in Idaho that doesn't matter because it's hard to get anywhere because there's just going to be snow everywhere. But for those, I guess the article gave a case, which it makes sense for like warmer area parks, more towards the south of the United States that people could go to that would be cooler, but you could enjoy it as well and it would be free, but still cool idea, really great. And I thought I would share it with you all. The last one here is the fun one and the last one of the main stories. Amtrak might come to Boise and Salt Lake City. This comes by KTVB7 by Andrew Bertline. Several months back, the federal government passed the Infrastructure Act that sent aid of $66 billion to improve train systems across the U.S., 
Some of this money is being considered for an Amtrak line from Salt Lake City to the Treasure Valley slash Boise area. The Boise Metro Chamber had a discussion panel last Thursday. City leaders and the Chamber of Commerce worked alongside cities from Caldwell to Mountain Home to make the application for the federal funds. The hope is that there would be multiple stops along the route throughout the Treasure Valley so it would help benefit everyone and give commerce and different stuff and connect us to the south. With that said, it is unsure if it will happen. Once the application is approved in March, the federal government would pay for a study to determine what it would take to build the line, plus studies to determine the demand, cost, and what infrastructure would be needed to be built for its completion. If it makes it through all of that, the federal government would fund 100% of those previously named studies, pay for 90% of the first year of operation, and 80% of the needed improvements for the rail system. With that said, the Boise panel said that if everything goes according to plan, we won't see a train between here and Salt Lake for another five to ten years, which is sad. I really would like to have it now in my human nature. I want it now because it would be so cool to be able to just jump on a train, go down to Salt Lake and like hang out there, do stuff with some friends and then maybe get a hotel or uh, Airbnb or something and then travel up the next day. You could do a full like weekend excursion. Honestly, I think a cooler thing would be to have a train to go to the coast. I remember when I was younger, there was this friend that I had that I walked the park. He was older and he would talk about when he was younger, that when the trains were still coming in and out of Boise, that his family on like before Sunday or whatever, but I think it was like on Friday nights, they would get on the night train to go to the Oregon coast. And then they would be at the Oregon coast all Saturday and they could do stuff and everything. And then they would drive back on the night train and then get into town and everything. And then they would go to church and then just a whole kind of weekend thing. And it was cheap and it was affordable and they did it, you know, at least two or three times during the summer and spring and fall months and different stuff. And I thought that was really cool. And it'd be really nice to bring that back with the trains because, you know, sometimes you don't want the cheapness of like driving and all the work that takes. And then a train might be cheaper, but yeah, it doesn't get you there as fast, but at least it's cheaper and you can be more relaxed and that's what you're paying for. And then you've got the plane, which is like the fastest way to get around that if you want to get there to there, you can do that super quick. And I think trains would be just like a nice medium in that transportation or travel situation where you're like, hey, I don't need the fast fastest way to get around. I just want to get around and not have to drive myself that I could just focus. And I feel like a train would just be an amazing spot to put that in. Cause like, say I want to travel across the country and I don't need to get across the country in two, three, four hours. I just want to travel and it doesn't need to be the most efficient or quick. It just needs to be a relaxing experience. Well, that's where the railroad could come in and you could have trains and it would be more laid back. And that's what I think it like used to be. It'd be really cool to have that here in the Treasure Valley between the two. I would prefer the Oregon Coast more than Salt Lake. But then again, I know some people really like Salt Lake and all the stuff down there. And granted, I haven't spent a lot, but that would be really nice. And theoretically, maybe it would bring gas prices down a little bit. I don't know. Because down in Salt Lake, they have like a refinery and everything for all the oils. I think it goes through every single different grade of oil that can be refined. So in theory, having that train being a direct connection to the Boise Treasure Valley area, it would bring the cost of fuel prices down maybe. I I don't know. Maybe. I mean, they already have the rail lines between there. So I'd assume that it'd be easy unless they don't have the rail lines. Then that's a different story. But anywho, we'll finish. That's the last of the main articles and we'll get into the quickies here and wrap this up. First quickie is 1910 Coffee Company. This comes by the Shoshone Press by Molly Roberts. In Wallace, Idaho, 51 minutes from Coeur d'Alene, a new coffee shop has opened. It's called 1910 Coffee and had its grand opening two Sundays ago. The business is run by Abai Burger and Zoe Zanetti. They are serving coffee, tea, hot chocolate, Red Bull, and Lotus Blast. The name was inspired by the 1910 fire where one-third of the town burned to the ground. They wanted to remember this event because of how it shaped and molded the town into what it is today, according to them. Shooting in Boise, this comes by KTVB7 by staff. Thursday night, a person was taken to the hospital with gunshot wounds. Police received reports of shots being fired around 11.45 p.m. at West Colonial Street. Witnesses gave the officer a description of a car that left the area at a high rate of speed. The car and owner were later found on Franklin Road. When the 18-year-old man was pulled over, he then tried to drive away from the officers. He is now in custody and booked in at the Ada County Jail awaiting his sentence or trial, whichever the two, however that works. Fiber in Idaho Falls. This comes by East Idaho News. The author is unknown. They did not state. Contractors of Idaho Falls Fiber started putting overhead fiber along Lincoln between Yellowstone Highway and Woodruff Avenue last Tuesday. For those wondering why there was a closure and traffic in the area, that might be the reason why. 
Pullman Hospital had water issues. This comes by Moscow Pullman Daily News by Emily Daly. So the front entrance to the Pullman Regional Hospital has been closed and will be closed for another week. The reason for this comes down to some water damage and overhead sprinkler pipe in an entry was discovered to be broken on Christmas Eve. The water was shut off and minimal damage was caused. They're getting it fixed and the entry should be open in the coming weeks. Sawtooth National Forest is hiring. This comes by KTVB7 by staff. The forestry service for the Sawtooth National Forest is hiring for several summer jobs. For those interested, they are asking for you to come with your resume, both physical copy and a digital copy and a laptop computer. Boise rental prices up. This comes by the Boise Dev by Donde. According to apartmentlist.com, the average overall price for apartments went up from $1,305 a month to $1,342 a month. This is not the highest we've seen over the last year. In June of 2022, rent prices were at an average of $1,437 a month. Then they dropped down in December. In a positive light, the run-up we saw from 2020 to 2021 did not continue into 2022. In 2020 to 2021, we saw an increase of 25% compared to this last year from 2021 to 2022 with only 7.2%. Last one is power outage in Eastern Idaho. This comes by Eastern Idaho News by Andre Olson. Last Tuesday, about 5,000 people were without power in Eastern Idaho. The outage affected areas around Idaho Falls, Blackfoot, and Shelley. The reason for the outage was a damaged power line that affected the company's Goshen substation. According to the Rocky Mountain Power, it's actually a transmission line, which is why they are related. I don't know the actual cause. Power was restored on Thursday at 3 p.m. If I missed something, got something wrong, or you have some advice for the show, then send me an email at localyokelidaho at 2022 at gmail.com or tweet me at localyokelidaho on Twitter. For right now, this show is just a one-man show, so I can't afford to go over everything, but I hope I can cover as much as possible. Thank you for your support. That's all for now, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your week. Godspeed. Godspeed.